So um, terrific. All of you, this is Dr. Brad Conrad, Bradley Conrad. Um, he is a professor of education at Capital University, and I had the privilege of working with him in my previous life. Um, but Brad has a really unique background in that he is an educator, but also uh, does a lot with technology when he's teaching. And then as he's doing, um, he's been publishing a blog and a book and all kinds of stuff, right? Um, yeah. But, um, I'm going to let him explain a little bit more about his background, but he's here kind of today just to, you know, in this new kind of reality that we have for now, how do we make sure that we can do what we need to do? So Brad, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so hi everyone. Thanks for having me here today. I'm very excited to talk to you. And thank you for all the feedback you gave me when I asked you uh, a list of the questions from you. So I really did take those and have them drive the presentation today. So um, let me just, I'll give you a quick little bit about my background. Um, so I've been in K-12 education, well, I mean, I guess all told 20 years plus. Um, I spent about 11 years of my career as a high school teacher, uh, instructional coach, uh, department chair, and all kinds of other roles um, in predominantly Title I schools. Um, and then um, I've, you know, my sort of moved on to higher ed, and I, I'm, I'm working in teacher ed right now. So uh, I'm still very much in schools and working with schools. And as Ann mentioned, um, I'm leading a team of people across the country that are, um, we do a blog um, called Tales from the Classroom. Um, where we're trying to actually speak to um, teachers and parents and other educators about what's really going on in the classroom and try to do so in a way that's very authentic and also can draw at times upon the research to inform best practices. So um, I got a relatively wide breadth of knowledge um, when it comes to sort of the educational literature. Um, my background is as a curriculum person, so that might come through sometimes. I write curriculum. I love curriculum. It's my thing. Um, but I also um, have been uh, very attuned to uh, various elements of communication when it comes to uh, teachers uh, speaking with parents. And I know that you all have um, a very unique, uh, I spent a good deal of time with Kathy, uh, or talking to Kathy, which is extremely helpful to get a good sense of um, the work that you're doing and um, looking at different ways that I might be able to help you and got some in input from Jenna as well to make sure that I could try to tailor what we're going to talk about today. So that's enough background blabbering about me. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a screen share really quickly and sort of give you an overview of where I was hoping to go today. Um, I know I probably overplanned, um, which is always the mark of a good teacher, right? Um, so, and that's okay. Um, but, but I've got some resources to share with you and, and um, a, a number of other things. So I'm just going to kind of pop into that if I might. Okay. There we go. Awesome. So this is sort of the overview. Um, well, um, we did the intro and here's the overview. So um, I wanted to talk, I'm actually going to start talking about social emotional learning for teachers um, and how, why that's critical. And I think it's something that it's always helpful to hear from someone. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. Um, then I wanted to get into some generalized tips for communicating with parents because I know that's the big topic of the day. Um, and then I really want to dive into, I spent a lot of time digging into the literature for you and drawing also on my own experiences um, to talk about, uh, to answer some of the questions that you post. Um, and then I wanted to share some tools for parent communications that you have. And if we have time permitting, I don't know that we will because it is packed. I wanted to give you space to work with uh, one of those proposed tools, or at the very least, I'll give you some uh, direction for how you might use them when you get out of here. Because my aim is, is I hope that I don't spend an hour of your time boring you to death and giving you nothing that's useful to you. So um, that's very, very critical to me that this is a useful uh, experience for you. But let me um, start with um, social emotional learning for teachers. Um, so some of the work I do, I, as Anne alluded to, I just recently published a book and one of the things uh, one of the chapters in that, it was on uh, different approaches to lesson planning. And one of the chapters in there is a chapter on integrated uh, social emotional learning in lesson planning. Um, and without getting into the details of that, um, I've been doing a lot of work leading up to that on the import of SEL um, for, for our kids, but also especially for you who have very high stress um, jobs. So I, I sort of wanted to share with you a couple of stats I thought that were important for you to hear why this is salient. Um, about half of the 3.4 million teachers in the, in the U.S. leave the profession after a year, which is astounding. Um, every two years, high-need schools lose 50% of their teachers, it's, which this all speaks to the anxiety um, that can be created in our work. 
Um, every state has a teacher shortage in special education except for two, which is stunning. Um, the attrition rate of special educators is a special education teacher is actually double what it is of a general education teacher, which again speaks to that import of the SEL. And 85% of teachers polled recently said that they feel like there's a work life imbalance, which again speaks to the need for social emotional learning. So I just wanted to sort of start with this place um, to talk about why it's important for you to pay attention to your social emotional needs first and foremost. Um, especially in, in the work that you, we all do. Um, some strategies to think about, I just wanted to offer to you um, to take as you will. Um, practicing mindfulness, um, doing things like uh, meditation or just breathing or being in the moment rather than letting our minds take our, the, the, get the better of us, which can lead us crazy to very difficult places. Um, making happiness a priority in your life is critical so that it's something that you don't it's you know the whole idea of putting your oxygen mask on before someone you put one on someone else's so i, I just want to encourage you to do that um finding opportunity to move about walk get up when you can um just to sort of reorient yourself um when when, when possible and connecting with people and each other is so critically important all the research on happiness and um well-being indicates that connection to people is really important and i know in our work it's very easy to get siloed very quickly so i just wanted to encourage you to to reach out and make those connections um reminding ourselves of our individual our per professional purpose can be very critical of why we do this you know that existential crisis thing of like why do i do this um i always kept a happy drawer of all the i still have a happy drawer actually of anything good that happens to me from a parent or a student or a colleague and i and when i'm having those tough days i always uh, reach into that drawer. So that might be a nice thing to think about. Um, getting outside and being in nature when possible is extremely helpful. Um, all the research indicates that. Um, being not so difficult, so hard on ourselves because we are, many of us are so very driven to be successful and help kiddos. And, and that's sort of what gets us a lot of us up in the morning. Um, just to remember that you're human. Um, and then practicing those SEL strategies with yourself. And there are many, but we won't go into that. But one thing I did want to do is I want to start here. With a social, I'm kind of modeling a little bit because I do this in my own classes and I'm encouraging other students to do this and the, and the research is bearing this out. Um, we, are, we are all, based off of this global pandemic and what is left with it, um, we, it, it the experts say that it's fair to, um, uh, to say that we are all victims of trauma and because of all that we've had. So with that comes some anxiety. So, so that need for social emotional learning increases even more. So I kind of wanted to start it here with you and just open it up um, for you to like, you can write this down, you can think about it um, and maybe, um, you know, just ponder sort of your thinking. Um, is, this is a social motion activity um, that could be used with anybody. Um, it's the rosebud and thorn activity. So a rose is just thinking of something positive or worthy of celebration going on in your life right now, anything. Anything small, big, otherwise. Um, a bud is something um, that you're looking forward to, sort of, it hasn't bloomed yet, but it's like, oh, I know that you, maybe you're planning a vacation. I know that's tough these days. Um, you know, maybe there's so something you're going to be doing or something even on television you're looking forward to watching. The new Cobra Kai is out. Um, and then a thorn, something that you might need help with, something that you're struggling with that you might um, reach out to somebody uh, to get a little bit more support. And then on the bottom, maybe just to think about what would you need to um, turn that thorn into a rose. So what would be the approach to getting that help? What would that look like for you? I just want to give some space, a couple of minutes, just to give you a chance. You can write it down. You can think about it, whatever you're comfortable with, but just sort of get into the space of, um, you know, thinking through where you are socially, emotionally at this moment right now. We'll go about another minute.
All right, if you could wrap up your thought, I'll give you a second to do that. Just very briefly, does anybody want to share any of the rosebuds or thorns um, that you were thinking about or writing about? And it's okay, it's, you're not, it's just an invitation. I can share, this is Molly. Hi, Molly. Hi, so my rose is, it's my birthday today. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. And my <laughs> bud is I'm looking forward to my next birthday as well, because I know it's going to be an awesome year. And my thorn is really um, <sighs> kind of um, figuring out how to stay connected when I'm working from home. I'm seeing my family is on Zoom. I'm <laughs> not feeling quite as um, impactful as I had in my role. So that's something that that thorn is almost like a challenge of how I can actually meet that and feel better about how things are right now because they are what they are. Yeah, that's no, I appreciate that Molly and you're right. It, I think it's a challenge for all of us you know, feeling that lack of connection, even though like in some ways it's like you're so grateful that we've got technology, but on the other hand, it's not quite the same as when you're with somebody face to face in your home or somewhere else at a restaurant. Remember that? That was cool. Um, no, thank you, Molly. I appreciate that. Um, are, does anybody else want to offer up some thoughts? And that's totally, like I said, it's just an invitation. Okay. Good teacher wait time, right? That was good. Okay. Let's, um, dive in then to some of the general tips on communicating with parents. I know a lot of you probably know many of these things and some of these are re, uh, rehashing of things you know, but I'm hoping that there's some new information. And certainly when we dive into your uh, questions um, that you had posed, uh, I hope that that's fresh information for sure. So um, looking at some of the literature that's out there, these are some of the like big ideas of things to do. One being uh, when talking to parents, that is. Um, one being warm and positive uh, as best we can. I know sometimes that can be a challenge, um, especially when we're stressed, which speaks back to SEL piece. Um, making parents feel valuable, um, you know, and we can do that obviously in a number of different ways, but honoring, you know, their thoughts, um, their feelings, and so on, um, obviously can be really critical. Um, and then one of the big things that's being talked about a lot um, is this notion of um, one-way versus two-way communication. Whereas, you know, the one-way communication is a bit more didactic where we're sort of talking at parents, we're telling them what we see, we're telling them um, what the issues might be, or even the successes. Um, but there isn't necessarily that feedback loop that you might get in a two-way conversation. And I'm going to talk about sort of that partnership piece that I think is extremely critical and the research bears this out. And I felt I've experienced this in my own career. Um, that uh, when, when we sort of take this team approach to communication. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, communicating through technology has been found um, to be really helpful. And I'd ask Kathy about, you know, obviously you've got to take into consideration um, the techn technology availability to your parents and families um, is obviously a, a piece of, 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 the, of the puzzle there. But um, technology is being shown to be a really great way, not just to communicate, but to incorporate that two-way communication. And that's a whole nother PD of like, well, what does that look like and how do you formulate that? Um, but, um, but the idea is that the, using those visual, digital means can be a really great way of having that two-way communication versus like, you know, when it's, you know, something like a newsletter or a quick email update of just telling, you know, didactically telling things that are going on. Um, getting to know the families, the culture of the family is critical. And when we say culture, that's a loaded word. Um, I mean that in the broadest sense that there is. Culture being, you know, the gender, ethnicity, uh, race, um, you know, the geographic culture, the family culture, and all of those other elements that make up a religious culture. And you could go on and on and on because culture has so many layers to it. But really getting to know the culture of the family can be extremely helpful in communicating, um, you know, just sort of reading through how they, how they communicate to how you communicate to them. Um, that can be really helpful um, because sometimes those cultural barriers can get in the way of what we're trying to say um, because we're not coming, necessarily coming across in a way that's received uh, and as it's intended. 
Um, sharing successes is obviously critical. Any little success is always great um, to have that sort of asset lens when we're talking to parents. Um, and then again, inviting parents into the decision-making process when, when possible um, and talking through, instead of sort of doing education to the kiddos, um, inviting them into the process of saying, you know, as the lead, of course, and the experts of, you know, sort of what we want to do and, and, and getting some input on that as well. And you probably know as teachers, we can usually get people to where we want them to go by asking the right questions. That's just kind of what we do. Um, I, I wanted to turn to this a little bit. I, I had intentionally intended to look at this at first, but I think this is actually a good guide. Um, this is from the work um, that I've done with my colleagues, and I've been, uh, frankly, I've been doing this work for the last uh, 13, 14 years or so, um, looking at the quality of, percept of what we call perceptive teachers. And basically what that is without going into the weeds, uh, that's a synthesis of everything pretty much that's ever been written about culturally responsive teaching, uh, anything in psychology, um, anything in general education about what, it, what are the qualities of really good teachers. And I think we can draw on that when we think about communicating with parents, because I, I believe these are some of these are communication skills um, that transcend and are useful. So things like being open-minded, um, you know, being, being receptive to the different ideas that are out there, willing to take risks, um, willing to challenge our own perspectives, um, you know, take different points of view. I think that can be really extreme. We know it can be very helpful when talking with parents. Um, and then this sort of speaks to that cultural piece I was talking about, but this notion of like sort of being aware, aware of how we're coming across, aware of how others are receiving us, um, being sort of open to feedback, and the, um, you know having that that no that that lens of um, you know how, how how are things going here you know and, and being able to read the room if you will sort of um, and then of course that caring piece speaks uh, similarly to that warm and positive tone um, but you know showing care for the kiddos and then of course you know the parents that you care about the kiddos um, and and in, in turn for them is obviously very helpful um, and then that authentic piece that gets lost like being who you are, right? Um, being genuinely you and, and even being willing to be a little bit um, vulnerable in a sense of letting them know a little bit about who you are. You know, obviously everybody's got a different level of comfort with that piece, um, but, but that authenticity piece can go a really long way in building connections and um, being able to communicate difficult um, information, which I know um, so many of you are asked to do on a regular basis. And then um, this is the second part of the, the framework. It looks at sort of the what we do. And, and I just thought I'd include it here for a couple of reasons. Um, one that might be able to help sort of you when you're even thinking about working with kiddos um, and then even when talking to parents, but um, this could be helpful potentially. Um, but personalizing the educational experience um, is something that's extremely valuable and uh, seen frequently from really good teachers um, doing things, you know, finding ways to, make it meaningful and relevant. And I think that, you know, that, that comes across in communication as well of, you know, why is it what we're doing meaningful and relevant to you, your family, your child, et cetera. Um, teaching the whole person, which I know you are asked to do on a regular basis. So beyond just the uh, academic content, but, you know, those sort of, even the very most basic life skills, um, you know, th that's obviously a really important piece. And I know that's a big embedded very much in what you do. Um, being intentional about the things that we're doing, um, you know, be our curricular choices, uh, you know, the, the kinds of uh, ways that we're going to engage and so on and so forth, um, you know, is obviously extremely helpful. And, and as I know, this is sort of, again, embedded in your work, I know, um, developing autonomy with the kiddos as best you can, obviously, depending on their developmental ability um, to, to need us less and less as, as, as we're able. Um, so that's sort of like a big broader piece, but I really wanted to spend more time looking at your questions. Um, so one of the big questions that came up uh, was, are there evidence-based approaches in supporting families as they do the hard emotional work um, that they're regularly doing? So here are just some uh, tips on, built off of the literature on things that you might be able to do. So one of those things is to get to know about the kinds of activities that um, the families um, and the kids take part in and that are meaningful to them, which we can take, we can draw upon as we are um, working with working with kids when we're thinking about different kinds of things that we can do. Um, this can be uh, extremely helpful. Um, being a good listener and asking reflective questions, like kind of going into that teacher mode, right? 
um, of, you know, if they're, they're having issues or even if you're seeing issues to, um, rather than, you know, saying, here's what's going on, um, you know, asking those kind of reflective questions to help them sort of uh, get to a point of, of, of understanding or recognition can be really helpful. Um, you know, it's, we do this a lot when we do reflective question asking and instructional coaching. Um, they do it and um, therapists do it all the time when they're meeting with their um, patients. And it's the same kind of approach that we could take with parents um, is, you know, asking those kinds of reflective questions um, and helping them come to conclusions of their own. Um, obviously, affirming feelings is extremely helpful. Um, you know, just not, and, and I think being careful not to say, yes, I understand, because oftentimes we do that with good intention, but sometimes we don't really understand because we're not in their place. So, you know, just, I can imagine that must be very difficult in those kinds of, of, of responses. Um, and then I put a link on here and I could share this PowerPoint with all of you. Um, one big thing is, is recognizing our own limitations. And I, I run into this regularly, especially as a university professor, believe it or not. Um, when students will, or my advisees will come ask me for help on different things, I don't always have the answers. Um, and, and, and my skill set is limited, right? Like just everybody's. So uh, what I've learned over the years, and, and the research says this is very helpful for teachers across the board, and is um, referring parents to appropriate uh, appropriate places. And, and in this case, I said advocacy organization. And on this link is a link to a number of different helpful um, parents and family advocacy organizations um, that can help them with all kinds of things from education to support. So um, just some things to think about. Um, and then along with that, um, being in communication with um, professions who might already be working with the families can be really helpful so that you sort of have a that broader picture. I know that's not always um, possible. And I know that there are certain, you know, HIPAA rules and things of that nature. But um, any, the, the, the broader communication um, that you can have, the better. Um, and then helping children, uh, parents understand their kids' dis disabilities uh, any way you can through all of these things that I've listed here, websites and handouts or readings, um, but, but empowering them, sort of building capacity within them to help them have a greater sense of what is this disability? How can I help my kiddo with this disability? Um, you know, and, and many other things. And then finally, um, as I sort of alluded to, is, is having that wisdom to, to recognize we should not, we, it's not, not discussing things that we might not be knowledgeable about. So like, for example, you know, a big thing that often happens, uh, and, and I've read and seen uh, firsthand, uh, a lot of this is, you know, we work with kids and we can sort of see things. So like, for example, you might see a kid who, you know, you think, oh my goodness, this kid looks like she's dyslexic or he's dyslexic. Um, but it's really important for us not to share that necessarily with parents. We might say that we've got a hunch, um, but, but to diagnose uh, certainly isn't. But, refer, but instead referring to people who, who would be able to help in that um, would be a really good approach. I want to just take a quick pause um, for a second and ask what question, if there are any questions that have bubbled up for you at this point. Okay, then let's turn to, oops, back. The second question that was posed, um, are there evidence-based approaches to difficult conversations of any kind um, with families? So um, yeah, lots. So here are some of those approaches. Um, again, it goes back to that establishing relationship piece um, by getting, to, and in this case, really getting to know what their wishes are, what their concerns are, um, and being really intentional about building that bond of trust, sort of giving them the sense that like, you know, you have their child and their family's best interest in, ball, in, in mind. Um, and I mentioned this before with the, uh, um, with the authenticity piece, but sharing who you are as well. That um, research indicates that actually builds bonds of trust, that you're like a human, not just teacher person who comes in, right? So, um, you know, and again, there's going to be different levels of comfortability with like how much you share, um, and that's okay, but, but sharing that you're human and that you have, you know, a life and feelings and thoughts um, and families and or whatever it might be um, with them can be, uh, can really help build those bonds. Um, and of course, you know, also identifying the assets in the, in the kiddos. Um, and even as, even with, within the parents can be extremely, extremely helpful. Um, and, and, and this is, I want, this is where I wanted to kind of speak to this. I think it's, it's very important to regularly make clear that there is a partnership going on here where we have a shared goal. Um, that there's a team of people between the students, 
the parents and us, the teachers, that we are working together towards a shared goal and it is a team effort. And, and actually a later question um, speaks to that of, of like, you know, I've seen some of you, it appears, have had issues with, you teach a skill to a kiddo and then you want them to transfer it at home and it doesn't always happen. And you, so one way to maybe help you in that piece is to really be upfront and saying, you know, and, and, and saying this is in fact a partnership and you're all three of us are, uh, have a same vested interest and need to be pulling, uh, you know, the proverbial weight, if you will, as we work towards helping, helping the kiddos. And then um, finding out their preferred method of communication can be helpful um, to make sure that you're getting more uh, interaction. Are they text people? Are they people that, you know, they would talk through an app or phone or whatever that might be. Um, and then the last set is uh, sharing, always sharing positive information before giving the diff getting into the more difficult discussion um, is extremely helpful, like talking about those assets, you know, because I mean, I'm sure some of you here are parents um, and you can, you know, being on the other side of it, you can imagine uh, some, you know, it's, oh, well, it's difficult for us as teachers to facilitate some of these conversations. Hearing some of those things are really hard for parents. So, um, you know, sharing that positive um, piece can be helpful in sort of cushioning the proverbial blow, if you will. And then rather than pointing out red flags, this goes back into that reflective questioning piece of, can we ask questions to get parents to come to their own conclusion? Now, I know sometimes we can't. I am not, I'm not uh, foolhardy enough to think that some parents are more with it than others. I get it. But if there are opportunities um, to sort of ask those questions to say, um, to get them to the point uh, of recognition of what you think might be you're seeing or what challenges you're facing, um, that can be extremely helpful and empowering. Um, and then when pointing out red flags, um, it's, it's, it, you know, it, that's obviously very important. Um, but having a conversation around how we can work with those red flags and help sort of, uh, work through those issues as a team, um, can be really valuable. And then there again is that parent input. There's a buy-in, there's a sort of team notion, even though you're the lead, you're the expert. Um, you can sort of guide that conversation for certain, but, but giving parents that sense of buy-in um, because they have input can be really helpful for you and make your life easier. Um, and then inviting um, parent input, again, when we're developing strategies to deal with difficult situations or behaviors. Um, obviously, can, I'm sure like when you do IEPs, um, you know, that's obviously a, a, can, can be a huge, big piece of the puzzle there. Um, the third question we had was, how do we decide what the most supportive approach is? And I hope you don't hate this answer, but it depends. Um, it really depends on who these folks are. Now you can see, obviously, um, knowing who these people are, developing these relationships is critical because it can help you determine which direction you're going to go. Um, you know, so, you know, who the parents are and how you communicate affects how you communicate with them. And, and it can certainly affect um, the course of action. Um, you know, and obviously students, uh, student, the students need should also be important when we're thinking about a course of action, but um, you know, who the parents are and what their needs are also a, a big piece, piece of the pie. Um, and then again, asking questions and seeing like, what is it that you need? And kind of flipping on that, being a good listener, um, you know, mentality can be really helpful. And again, when parents have that input, Generally, they feel the sense of buy-in, they get the sense of trust with you, they feel like they're heard, and it makes your life easier um, when you're working with, with families. Um, and then finally, seeking advice and support from colleagues is, it can be extremely helpful. Um, and sometimes, you know, like I said, we, we forget to draw upon our resources, but you all have a bunch of shared resources um, that are in this virtual room right now that I encourage you to draw upon. Um, question four of five. Um, so this is a, a, a bit, uh, I wanted to give the background on this because I think it was important to hear, but um, we may be the first individuals to mention something to a family, like for instance, red flags for autism. Uh, some families aren't ready to hear this um, or are open to exploring an evaluation or even discussing the topic. Uh, sometimes you're often forced uh, between having this tough conversation with a family before they go through the transi uh, transition process so they don't feel blindsided by the school when they bring up this topic. So what, what are some pointers on how to de-escalate such a situation um, or gently ease into the types of conversations so that we don't repel families from continuing with our services? 
So I dug deep into this one. That was a really good question. I think it's probably something that many of you are dealing with or have dealt with. Um, so one thing is, 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 and this is really important, it kind of goes back to that, you know, don't um, overstep our bounds, but not telling parents that their child has a learning disorder um, is, would obviously, is, is critical. Um, but that it might be an issue worth exploring. Um, so this is again where we could go into getting resources, getting them tested on whatever it is the issue that is that we're seeing. Um, but that can be, uh, and it also eases the tension a little bit, right? Versus like, this is what it is. Um, versus like, you know, this might be an issue, let's look into it. Um, that can certainly, you know, it almost like helps cushion the blow if there is something wrong. Um, and it puts a buffer between you and the parents so you're not sort of the, bad, the bearer of bad tidings, right? So that's, that's a really helpful tip, I believe, that can, that can help you. Um, and then offering them a pathway to exploration. So whatever that issue is, is it, you know, they need to see a pediatrician or a vision or a hearing specialist or someone else um, to help uh, try to figure out what the red flag issue is um, can be really helpful. And again, you're sort of this facilitator now um, versus the, you know, the end all be all of knowledge. And it takes some pressure off of you that you don't have, you, it, you, it's an unfair expectation to think that you are gonna be all of those things. You're not, no one is. So I, you know, I think so much gets heaped on the plate of teachers, especially teachers that are doing your, the work that you're doing, and it's an impossible job, which is it's why one of the main reasons we got all this turnover, right? Or why we got shortages. Um, but I think it's important for you to like give yourself that permission of like, you don't have all the answers and that's okay. No one does. So that's just um, a, a tip that can be very helpful for you. Um, again, back to the asset thing, telling them what that you do see with their child, you know, sort of the, you ever heard of the insult sandwich? You, you kind of give them a compliment and you go, oh, but this is going on. And then you give them a compliment. Um, you know, that's, that, that, but that's, that's important because then they, they don't see you as someone who only sees deficits, but you also see assets. Um, and then sharing with them how um, other supports could be beneficial for their child. So sort of, you know, this is why this could be really good if you do this, and this could be very helpful and actually make your life easier um, and, and kind of going in a, a, I don't want to say a sales position, but you're really, you know, trying to help parents see like, why is this valuable, what I'm suggesting here? Um, or, the, or why would these supports be useful for you? Um, and then obviously listening to their thinking and offering empathy, uh, we, we mentioned as a general tip, but again, it, it lands here of uh, just being a listener. And, you know, I'm, I can imagine this, that must be very difficult for you and those kinds of things. Um, and then if they're prepared to go for the through the transition process, um, you can empower them with knowledge by telling them like, here's, here's what you can expect. Because I'm sure you've probably seen and work with parents, you know, we, sometimes we forget how much we know about what we do because we do it every day. So we kind of, oh, second knowledge, um, you know, secondhand knowledge or it's, you know, everybody knows this. But I think it can be really, it, 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 no, I don't think, it can be extremely helpful to parents to empower them with like, okay, here's what this is gonna look like for you. And I can support you along the way as best I can. And again, you can't be the end all be all, but that can be extremely helpful for you um, when we work with parents and speaking through the, the red flag kinds of things. Um, and then the last question. Um, it can often be a struggle to get families to help their students generalize skills, skills that have been taught. What are some strategies to alleviate this issue? So how do we get parents to like um, reinforce the stuff that we're doing? So one of the things the research says is help the parents develop a routine. Like you're kind of, I mean, you're being a teacher to them too. And I'm probably, a lot of you already are experiencing this. So I'm telling you like, hey, slice bread. Um, but yeah, helping parents develop those routines and kind of teaching them how to do the reinforcement can be really helpful for you. Um, you know, and obviously parents are all over the board. Some, you know, some are just, they'll just go run with it, take the ball and run with it. And some it's like pulling teeth. Um, but if you can um, help them in developing those routines for reinforcement and pr on an ongoing basis, right? Like if you're working on a particular skill on this day or even this week um, to, to help them say, all right, here's a great thing that we could do to help reinforce what we're doing here. That can be really helpful for you. And, and I'll, we'll talk about it in a second, but that's, where, that's a great place where you could use the you know, um, electronic communications or other forms of communication to sort of you know, reinforce like, hey, just making sure tonight that you're doing X um, or whatever that is. Um, then directly, directly soliciting from parents um, their help by giving them just one thing to focus on. You know, right? Instead of like, we got to do this, 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 and this, sort of like that laser focus, like, let's just really work on this this week or today or, you know, the next couple of days or whatever that is. But helping them, you know, not feel overwhelmed. Um, as you probably heard, 
especially now that we're in remote learning, so many parents are feeling like, oh my God, I can't manage my own life. How am I going to deal with this? So if you can really like pick that, what's that really important thing that we're working on and say, let's do that this week. And obviously every family is going to be a little different. Some are just doing great and they can, they can handle more than one thing. But for those that might not be, that, that's a good strategy. Um, and then, you know, again, providing activities um, parents could do with their, with their kiddos. So, you know, you're, you're, it's, I guess I call it the parent curriculum where you say, here's what you could do to reinforce. Um, that can be extremely helpful and not all that time consuming, right? I mean, you don't have to write a whole lesson plan on it. You just say, here's one thing you can do. Um, and then building on parents' strengths as best you can, like sort of seeing their assets to help their child. So if we see certain things that they're really good at or they have proclivities towards, um, how can we leverage that a little bit to help us, help us get them to reinforce the stuff that we're working on with parents? Um, and actually, um, the research, as I mentioned, alluded to, is, um, really encourages us when possible to use technology to communicate, not only because it's an effective medium, but because it's actually easier on us than the ways that we've historically done to, uh, communication. Um, and we'll talk about some of those tools a little bit um, now, actually. <laughs> so these are just a couple of the tools I wanted to share with you. And I'm not going to go into detail on like demoing them, but I, I will hit one a little more that I've, I've used all of these in different ways. Um, but they are tools that can be helpful with specific to parent communication. So remind is one of them. It's a, it's an app and it's also, you know, you can use it online. Um, and I don't know if this will show up for you. Let me see. Am I sharing the right screen? I don't know that I am. Um, I'm gonna just switch screen shares real quick on you. Um, okay, there we go. And then I wanna jump into this one. So this is Remind. Um, it's very easy, you can sign up. Um, and what it does is it's, and most of these are built this way, like these, so they were really intentional when they built these, uh, a lot of these, uh, parent communication technologies to make them for um, two-way communication. So what you can do through this, if you haven't used it before, is you can send, you can add people to your list of who you wanna communicate with. You can, you can, you know, parents, you can have groups of parents, you can just have individuals, um, and you can send out mass communications very quickly to them. They're basically like, almost like getting a text message. Um, you can send out materials to them very easily as attachments. Um, and they're a really great way to build parent engagement. Um, and one, and this is just one of them that um, people have used. You can even put in, you can schedule appointments through here. You can set up reminders um, for for them to do certain things that you might want them to do, like those, re excuse me, those reinforcement activities, um, and and so forth. So that can be th those can be terrific, um, terrific tools to use. Um, Blooms uh, is another one that is really popular. I'm gonna switch screens. I'm hoping you can see that. Actually, I'm gonna stop share and then reshare. Blooms is a great one. It's, it's pretty widely used actually in the district. Some of you may have come across these. Um, and this is actually for my own kids. They're, they use it in their school. Um, and it's very similar. Um, you can have you know, broad communication. You can do one-on-one -on -one chats with parents. Um, you can schedule things. You can put in due dates. Um, you can send pictures, as you can see here. Um, you know, you catch, you know, your, the students you're working with doing something really great. You can snap a picture and send it to the parents. Um, you can do all kinds of things, um, you know, with this to help build that communication um, in, in a really quick and easy way. And again, Blooms is very same thing. I mean, you're looking at the desktop version, but it also has its own app um, that you can download that's available to you. Um, and then the last one I wanted to share with you is Living Tree. And this is actually a really cool app. This, I learned a lot about this company actually sort of through Tales from the Classroom. Um, they are, oh, here, let me switch over there. They, this company was founded by, the, this person was a former um, superintendent of schools in Virginia. And he is a parent communication expert that's been writing about and speaking about parent communication forever. Um, and his, his real focus is on parent engagement. So this app is, again, very similar to the other ones, um, but really intentional about, you know, that two-way communication. And this is actually from one of my classes, I've used it, um, where we can do things like, again, we, I could sk schedule events, I can schedule reminders, um, you have your own inbox, 
um, where you can compose messages. And then we also have, um, we can do these conversations that are kind of like text and include, you know, videos, uh, photos, files that we want to share or anything else like that. But this is another one of those really great um, technology tools um, that can be helpful for you. And then, you know, if parents set this up on their smart device, you know, they can get alerts as soon as you post something and they'll know that like, oh, you know, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so posted this really cool picture or they sent me, you know, an important file that I need or whatever that might be. Or if you're saying sharing resources or whatever that might be, um, these are terrific tools um, that you might be able to incorporate um, in your classroom and in your, in your, I mean, in your practice, in your proverbial classroom. Um, so there we go. And there. So, um, and the last thing, it's a little bit more old school. And I know that your situations are all over the board, especially because we're virtual. But um, I, I, I reached out to several of um, special education um, experts that I know and, and talked to them about like, you know, I got, obviously got some tips for some things to share with you. But uh, when I was talking about like tools, tools they use or have their students use or have used themselves, the home to school notebook is a big one. And they said, especially, um, it can be especially effective in working um, with kids who might be nonverbal or have really high special needs. Um, these are just really quick, short teacher notes that you can share um, with parents uh, or and um, students can even do things like choose little things and talk uh, to talk about how they felt when they were doing different things throughout the day. Um, so that sort of, you know, that back and forth. Now that can be, you know, an actual notebook or it could, you know, be something more virtual like, you know, uh, notes or a Google doc or something like that. But, but that this, this, um, a lot of my colleagues have said uh, has got given them a lot of bang for their buck, so to speak, uh, when it came to working with um, communicate when, when it came to communicating with parents. So I want to take a pause there um, before we kind of um, dive in uh, into something a little bit more. So let me stop the share. Let me ask what questions you have. And I see there's some things in the chat. I don't know if there's anything. Oh, that's great. What questions do you have or what things you're wondering about or what things um, have I not uh, begun to even talk about that would be helpful to you? Okay, that was a good long one. Uh, Brett, I have a question. What are your thoughts about this Seesaw app? Because we have some um, teachers and parents um, that are using that through like our children's school. Okay. Um, and it's not very clear. So what are your thoughts on that app? On the Seesaw? Um, yeah, I've seen it used um, in a couple of different situations. I mean, I think it's kind of somewhat similar to the other apps that I've been, you know, sh sharing with you, I think you can see like they kind of cross over a lot. Um, you know, I've, I've heard mixed results that some people love it and some people think it's really clunky and hard to work with. I think on a more broader sense, like for some of you that are, um, uh, no, is anybody, actually, let me take a step back. Are you, while the schools are using this, are they, are the teachers from the homeschool um, communicating with that to the families that you're working with? It's actually my child's teacher at school is using the app and it's very hard um, to use and, yeah. and to communicate with. Um, and that's what our biggest issue is with it. Yeah, I think it's really clunky. I do. I agree with you. Um, honestly, if I was picking and I have picked, I use them with my students because I, well, I teach future teachers, right? So I'm always modeling stuff. So I, I, I use Living Tree and Blooms. Those seem to be the least clunky, easiest to use, um, very easy to communicate tools. Like it's very easy, to, very intuitive. And I'm one of those people, like I don't wanna have to think about the interface. I just want it to be easy. Like the button should be obvious when I wanna send a message. I think those tools are far superior, honestly, um, than, than the Seesaw. My wife actually uses Seesaw. She teaches in Upper Arlington and they use Seesaw in there. And I've seen, I've sort of, watched her play with it and I play with it myself a little bit and it's kind of clunky. I don't particularly love it. So I think these other tools would be more useful to you and more user friendly. Okay, what other questions do you have? Uh, Brad, I did have a question for you. Um, sure. 
So for early intervention, I think one of our biggest challenges that we're having with the screen mm -hmm. is that when we have new families that we've never met before. Okay. So I think what we're having a hard time with is like, you know, in the beginning we talked about like establishing like that rapport and finding out what's important to them and things like that. And now that we're not in the home, it's like a little bit harder to start that rapport relationship, especially when, um, you know, on the screen, the child might be running around a lot in the background. Right. So you're only getting like a tiny little snippet here, a tiny little snippet there. And right. then you're supposed to be working on all these strategies and stuff with these families. So just trying maybe to like some tips or tricks or anything on how to start building that rapport or yeah. those relationships, like some probing questions maybe for when we can't really talk to them very much, um, you know, uh, face to face. Yeah, that's tough. No, and it's a great question. So I think one thing, Jenna, is um, I think not just being intentional, but um, but taking the time to and make it very clear to the parents that like you want to get to know them, right? So is it possible to like set up a, a meet and greet just to like talk through like, hey, how are things going? Who are you? Tell me about your child. Tell me about you. Um, you know, it's really almost like if you were in the classroom. So like when you're in, in um, when you're in the classroom and you want to build your classroom environment, right? You, well, to do that, you take the time up front at the beginning of the year to like develop relationships, get to know the kids, get the kids to know each other and so on and so forth. Like, you know, so I think, I think taking like, even, you know, I've seen some really effective things where, you know, before we even get into working on skills and development, we really go slow to go fast, right? We take that time up front to set up, and now we're virtual. So it'll be like, can we set up a virtual meeting just to sit down and chat um, and talk through like, hey, you know, what's worrying you? Who, who are you? What are you interested in? What do you need? What do you feel like your child needs? Um, you know, and really, I think being, I mean, really the word is intentional about building relationship, not just like we're gonna sneak it in when we get the opportunity, but it's like, it's front and center. Um, we, I want to build this relationship with you. I want to get to know you. I want to get to know what you need. I want to get to know your child and what your child needs. Um, so I think, you know, we can do, you know, and asking questions that align with those purposes, right? Those are your, your sort of entryways, you know, and they're, they're simple as who are you, you know, well, not, you know, but tell me about yourself. Um, you know, so tell me about your child. What, what is it that's interesting? What's, what's been challenging for you? How can, you know, what kind of support do you, you know, do you feel like you need or your child needs? I think asking those really direct questions and that goes back to that authenticity piece, which is actually why I brought that in. Um, that goes a really long way and, and it kind of creates that space for voice and it puts things front and center. And again, it's not like, you know, if you, you're thinking in a traditional classroom, it's it, not doing that as the equivalent of like walking in on day one and saying, all right, open your books to chapter one, let's go. Right. That sends a message. That sends a message that like, I don't really care that you're here. I'm just doing my job, leave me alone. Um, and I'm not saying that any of you feel that way at all. By no means am I saying that. I, I'm not even in a position to say that. Um, but, but when you do things like making it intentional, like say, I wanna set up time to talk and get to know you. I wanna hear what your worries are, your needs, you know, whatever that might be. Um, I think that sends a real strong message and that allows you to go, you know, to you, you draw on that, right? It's almost like you're building, you're, you're banking, emotionally banking stuff, um, assets that you can draw on later when you do have those hard conversations, or you do have something that's really challenging that you're dealing with, um, that you can draw on later on. Um, and, and also recognizing, like you said, I mean, you know, there are little kids running around in the background and that's hard and just sort of being, you know, flexible with that of like, that's okay. It's, hey, that's where we are right now. And world's a different place. So I don't know if that's a full answer to your question, Jenna, but I hope that that's helpful. I, I think it is helpful. Um, I think the, a big thing that kind of this made me think of is when we first go in and talk to the parents right now, virtually, we set up their plan. So when we go in to have that first visit, a lot of times we're thinking about that um, individualized family service plan that we put together and those goals to make sure yeah. that it is an effective visit for our compliance and right. our numbers and all that stuff. So just taking a second to step away from that and separate it um, while also realizing that 
establishing the rapport is only going to help with those strategies and reaching there. So I think, yeah, it does tie together very nicely. So thank no, I you. I appreciate that. And I, listen, I want to be clear. Like, I know that y'all have a finite amount of time. I get it. Like, I mean, it's hard, the work you do and your time is very precious, but I am, I'm not saying that you're going to always do this. You're not going to have random, you know, like let's have coffee on zoom. Right. I mean, or maybe you do, who knows? That'd be great. Um, but, but you know, it's really like that going slow to go fast at the beginning that you can draw on. So I just want to be really clear about that. That's something else. I would never expect you to be like doing that regularly all the time for the people that you, the kids that you're serviced. It's just, it's not feasible. Right. Brad, when I was teaching at canal, we, and as a teacher, we rolled our eyes hard at this when we were told that we had to have discovery nights the first week of school. So instead of back to school night, we had to have a parent teacher conference with every set of parents, but the parents told us only what they wanted us to know instead of what you heard like after first quarter. And I will tell you that to this day, I still run into parents that I had that first night meeting with and we built that connection in a different way. Like I see them out and eight years later now, they still are like, oh, you are Miss Callahan, you taught science. You did. And I remember more about their kid because I had that base before we got into all the weeds. So it was nice. Thanks, Anna, I appreciate that. It's true though. And I've experienced very similar things in my career as well and seen them happen. I mean, I'm not, so I'm not just an egghead drawn on the literature here. I'm backing up, you know, I, I'm a practitioner and I love teachers and I know the work that you do and it's hard work. Um, but, but it's, you know, I'm also drawn on, you know, my own experiences and what I've seen work well in school. So I hope that that comes across that I'm not just some nerdy academic from my ivory tower telling you all the smart stuff I know. It's not about that. It's, it's not, it's just, it's about, well, Hey, this is anecdotally worked. And then look, if you look at the people that research this stuff, they're saying it works. So I appreciate you saying that. And thanks. Okay. Other, what other questions do you have? I know we're getting near end of time. So I wanted to, I wanted to make sure I left space to answer anything you need. And it can be totally very personal. It doesn't have to be something that relates to every single person in the room. That's totally okay. Bradley? Yeah. So what I've encountered recently are um, parents, we have students that, you know, have great potential, uh, mm -hmm. great, great knowledge, uh, but parents that constantly, uh, almost underestimate their child's ability. They, they, they hover, they, they downplay their strengths. They, they well, maybe down the road, but I really doubt they'll reach that point. Um, mm -hmm. How do you have that conversation with the parent without alienating them that they're undervaluing th their child's abilities? That's a great question and a common issue. Um, so it's a, it's a gentle balance, right? Um, I think you got to push back a little bit um, and I'll talk about what that might look like, um, but not too hard because you're right. You can totally create this adversarial relationship and, and they'll discount you. Like you don't know what you're talking about. I know my child, it's my child. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, subtle, you make little subtle inroads here and there. And I think everybody's a little bit different because, you know, you know, people take, their temperaments are different, right? And, and, and just how they process. But I think, you know, just little pushbacks, you know, if, if, you know, if you're looking to get to point F, you might start by saying like, hey, why don't we try, I think, I think you know, your son, your daughter could do, get to point A. Let's, let's try this out. Let's see if they can do it. Like almost treating it like a challenge. Let's see. It's like you build, it's like, it's like scaffolding, right? You build these little successes. And then by just like a little tiny success, like it starts to, the, the parents like, they see results, right? And when they see like, whoa, I didn't, I didn't think that would work, but it worked, right? But it was a nice, gentle, soft push point. Then you start to go, hey, why don't we try to see if we can get to step B? And the parents slowly start to get on board of like, oh my gosh, okay. And then you're building your ethos, right? Because they're like, oh my God, they know what they're talking about, right? Um, and they suddenly start buying into you and, and you know, you're doing these wonderful things that they didn't even think were possible for their child, which you did, and that's fine. Um, but you're, you know, you're, you're slowly working to that point. And I think that's really the, the secret in many ways is that like, it's a slow process and, and you can only push a little, everybody's different how hard you can push, right? But just push a little bit and, you know, build, scaffold that and build that, build those successes to get where you finally get to the point you, you get to. But it's, I, I don't think it's a conversation where like, 
you know, we're going to go to point F, right? That's, it, that's a immediate, whoa, that's too much. My kid can't do that. So I think that that's sort of, it's, I don't know, it's a subtle way to do it. Um, it's, it's not sneaky, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, a intentionally uh, focused way of going about and pushing back. I hope that helps. Yes, sir, it does. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the question. What other questions do you have? Okay. All right. So the last thing I was going to say, just to sort of um, tie things all together, because I see the word, I know that we're coming near to the end of time. Um, I want, oh, I didn't share the screen. Sorry. Um, I wanted to um, just encourage you, and, and I know everybody's different, and some of you have more levels of comfort with technology and not, but I really did want to encourage you to try out one of the tools that we talked about, um, you know, to, even if you don't even end up using it, just it take 10 minutes, five minutes to sign, just check it out, sign up. They're not going to send you a bunch of spam stuff. Um, you can create a class, enter some, enter some contact information of someone that you might re reach out to or a couple people, and maybe even consider sending a message. Just try it. And if it's totally not working for you and you go, I will never use this, fine. But at least you tried it. So I just want to encourage you to like maybe, um, you know, step outside of our, your comfort zone, which actually the research on happiness says is one of the keys to happiness. It's a happiness hack is getting outside of our comfort zones and just try something. And even if you totally don't use it, you can at least say you tried something new. So um, I just want to encourage you to do that. Maybe take 10 minutes today, like five minutes, uh, five minutes, give me five minutes today, try something. And if you don't like it, then that's okay. But maybe you will. And that would be really awesome. Um, so that's kind of all I've got. Um, I, I want to thank you all um, for letting me come talk to you and you listening to me. And I hope, I hope I was helpful today in some way. If you got one nugget of wisdom that you can actually, well, wisdom, one nugget of information that you can use in your actual classrooms or in your actual practice or uh, in your lives somehow, I, then it's a win. So I hope that, that that was valuable for you. That's all, folks. Thank you much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you all. And Brad, did I hear you say that you had a PowerPoint that you wanted me to share with everybody? Yeah, I can share. I'll email it to you and they can have like what I was using. So if they want some of those links and whatnot, they can, um, everybody can have access to them. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for taking your time out today. Um, everybody get up from your computer, stretch <laughs> and then come back and try one of those apps before we forget all the good stuff that Brad just told us. <laughs> um, we will have one more session that will start at 2.30. Oh, and do you want me to just put it in the chat? I can put the... the Actually, if you just chat. send it to me, I'm putting all of our presentations up on SharePoint. So we'll okay. just put them all there. Sounds great. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Thanks, rest Brad. of your day.